first, a big thank you to, to the LCA team for actually making me feel part of their family and allowing me to actually share this Bushman message. Um, I don't consider myself a Bushman expert, but I've learned enough from the Bushman to know that there is a lot that needs to be shared with as many people as possible. So thank you for giving me this opportunity. The screenshot you see there has been taken recently at the Great Sahel, Hill, which is in the northwestern corner of the Central Kalahari Game Reserve. And these are some of the members of the clan that I work with. And um, when we talk about conservation in Africa, I think that what we are looking at there is the original conservationists in Africa, and their record actually speaks for itself. Now, what drew me to this is, of course, our beautiful mammals that we all love, and wanting to set up some sort of process in which as many people as possible can get to actually enjoy our wildlife and to get in touch with nature. But unfortunately, we know that all these animals are in, in trouble. And I think we need to understand that together with the habitat loss and species loss, we have climate change, social decay, pandemics, and mental ill health on the increase, which in my opinion are all symptoms of a planet and humanity in a state of dysfunction, dis-ease, and disconnection. And the unfortunate reality is, although there are so many people doing such great work with conservation, um, uh, Sir uh, David Attenborough will tell us that over, the, over his lifetime, how much of our wildlife and wild places we have lost. So I would like to think that there's something else we need to consider. But thank goodness there are so many people doing so much good work, as you have actually told us and, and shown on your program, but I'd like to think that there's something more that could be done and perhaps we need to look at the cause and not just the symptoms to perhaps see a way that we can look after and conserve our natural heritage. And the root cause, in my opinion, is deeper than just overpopulation, which I will actually allude to a little bit later. Now, people might say, well, why listen to a message from the Bushmen? Firstly, and this may seem something that is, for a lot of people, may not seem necessary to mention, they are as equally human as any one of us. Some may not think so, unfortunately, as we'll also hear a little later. And their culture is recognized as the most successful in human history. Now, we may ask ourselves, what is their definition of success, which is also something we're going to talk about a little bit later down but they have been around for tens of thousands of years. So surely there's something that we can learn from them. And I'd like to con consider their culture as being the culture of conservation. And let's perhaps see if we can learn something from their culture. And what I've also found fascinating is that they have included ways of, of actually, on their culture of managing human psychological weaknesses, which is a lot about what I'm going to be talking to later, because I think our problem basically, which is going to determine the survival of all our species, actually lies in the human mind. And I think we all know the expression, and that is the most important habitat for all humanity and our wild creatures is actually the human mind. Now, I'm fortunate enough to work with some of the last remaining authentic Bushmen. I mentioned or put them in authentic in the commas because unfortunately, um, civilization or the march of civilization has taken its toll. But these are some of the Bushmen which are considered to be as close to the original Bush Bushmen as is available at the moment. And I have learned an enormous amount from them, which I intend to share. These were the original hunter-gatherers and sometimes called the first people of Africa. Some people may question also the, the term Bushmen that I use, but this is what they prefer to be called. And um, as some people prefer to think of Khoisan, etc., I'm not happy with that term because the culture of the Khoi and the San to me are, are very different. So to lump them together is not really a, an accurate description of who these people really are. So San, yes, or first people are names that I'd prefer to actually use. Now my connection with Bushman started with my concern and love 
for all that is African, really. Rural Africa, rural people and our animals. And I had a desire to try and reconnect people with nature. So I established a walking safari operation, which I call Get Real Africa, to get the art into the real Africa. And then I thought, well, why not try and get hold of some of the original um, children of nature, which is the Bushmen, and that has transformed my life subsequently. Part of this journey has been the actual fortunate um, coincidence of actually coming across a man called Madala. Here we have a picture of Madala or a Bushman, not actually Madala in this case, crossing the Kalahari because this is a story which for me actually um, introduced a lot of the mystique and mystery of Africa and of the Bushman people. Now on the left there, you'll see a map of Botswana, which is where I operate with the Central Kalahari Game Reserve. And what happened is that I ended up on the eastern side where you see the red dot on the bottom right there on a farm where I was looking for a place to actually do my walking safaris and to meet with Bushmen. And I came across this old man and I arrived at the farm on a day when he had just been fired. I didn't know why, but when I got back to the farm three, four months later, I actually arrived at the farm coming from South Africa of an evening and the farm owner was traveling southwards from Maun and we actually were due to meet at the farm. When I got to the farm, there was this man who I thought was Madala sitting under a tree. Now this man was probably closer to 80 than 70. But when I asked the local Africans, the Swana people as to what he was doing back in the farm and he'd been re-employed, they said, no, he just arrived that afternoon and he came to see the farm owner. So I found that rather interesting. Anyway, that night when we went to bed, he was sleeping next to the fire. The next morning we got up early to go to a local um, cattle post to meet with some bushmen. And as we traveled along this dirt path, we were following some um, lion spoor along the track. In this territory, which if you know the central Karahari is very open and barren, although this year there's been rain, but it can be very dry, sandy. We followed this for about 10, 12 kilometers when suddenly um, I saw the lion spore disappearing and there on the ground appeared these human footprints. So we, we stopped because I said to the farmer, I said, where will the footprints come from? There's nobody about you. And he stopped the truck and he spoke to the Africans who were standing on the back of the Land Cruiser looking over the top. And they said, those are Madalas. Now, I found that quite interesting because last night he was sleeping next to the fire when I went to sleep. And he, sometime during the night, had got up and walked and it already walked 10 or 12 kilometers. We continued to the cattle posts and strangely, there Madala is sitting under the trees. So I found this very interesting. So that evening we're sitting by the fire and um, the farm owner actually then spoke to the Tswana staff and said to them, did you find out what happened to Madala and why he deserted his post the October before, which was to look after the horses? And he disappeared and one of the horses were taken by lions that night, which is why he'd been fired. And they said, yes, he had gone to actually find his family. He felt his family needed him. Now, his family had been removed from the central Kalahari and transferred to a, a camp, a resettlement camp, up on the northwest corner where you see the other red dot. So he set off on foot to see his family. Now, this is where it gets very interesting because it is that time of the year that you people will know in Africa is called Suicide Month. He had actually walked a distance of probably 300 kilometers, found his family, walked back, because they needed something which he had at the camp, which was money, which he buried in a tin. Now you must ask the question, how did he know his family needed him? How did he navigate? How did he manage to actually walk that distance in the heat and in a place where at that time of the year, you don't find surface water? But then the, the final question, which the farm owner asked the, the locals is, how did he know that I was coming? 
And they said, we don't know. We haven't seen him since last year. He knew, he said, Chris has left and he's on his way to the farm. So this asks a lot of questions as to what is happening in the minds of the Bushmen. What do they know that we don't know? And how could a man of this age survive? So that really piqued my interest in the Bushmen. And so I continued to focus more on the, on the Bushmen and their culture than on actually my walking safaris. My first walk with a Bushman to test out exactly how much they knew and how well people would survive in the hot areas of the Kalahari and walking on sand actually revealed so much that um, was of interest to people generally who want to come on the walking safaris. It exceeded all my expectations. I, I learned more about animals and plants than I'd ever known before. Just to give you an example, um, I found a spoor, which I knew is a Hemsbok spoor, and I thought, well, I just wanted to make sure how connected this group were. And I called one of the men across, and they said to me, um, well, yes, you'll get the others to come and look, and he called two other guys. And they then came, and they started talking and clicking away and walking around and looking at spoor, et cetera. And they came to me as a group, and they said, this is a Hemsbok. It's a female. It is approximately this age, and it was here just before lunchtime yesterday. That's when I realized that I'm in a league here, which is way beyond my understanding. And from then onwards, I have learned so much more from them and always found them to be very accurate. But then there were some deeper revelations after spending time with them. And that really was, to me, what got me going. Two things. Firstly, to try and understand how they had managed to survive in this harsh climate where there's no water for probably five, six months of the year, I'm talking about surface water. And the other thing was the level of happiness that prevailed in the group. And I thought to myself, well, what have I been doing all my life, studying and working, etc. when here we have people who have nothing that have achieved a level of happiness that I had never encountered before. And so that is what really got my investigation going. Now, what we must understand is that some of um, what people believe about Bushmen, and very much so in Southern Africa, unfortunately, were historical perceptions created by the likes of William Birchall that you people, would know, a lot of people know about. Well, we've got the Birchall Ze Zebra and the Birchall's Kukul and Birchall Starling, etc. And he described the Bushmen as people with no written language, no religion, no leadership, no possessions, et cetera, et cetera, and basically the lowest form of humanity. And I'm afraid when or since I've been studying them, I actually realized that this was what I consider, this little word I've got here is ignorance, a combination of ignorance and arrogance that we have never tried to really understand from indigenous people why their culture is exactly what it is and what knowledge they might have that could be for the good of all and for conservation. And subsequently, we know that the Bushmen have been persecuted, subjugated and eliminated. Shot. And it was less than 100 years ago that the Bushmen are still being shot and hunted in Southern Africa. So my search for understanding was what is it about their cults and beliefs that enabled their remarkable success? And this success, the definition now I want to consider here is how humanity or how their people managed to survive, which must be the first criteria for any human success. And not just only survive, but also to thrive. And their wisdom provides some insight into the underlying causes of human dysfunction and the subsequent hurdles that I believe conservation faces today. So when we look at um, the reasons for their success, I divide this up into different categories and I consider their short-term survival, their skills and their knowledge they have of living with the bush, which are all so fascinating. And there I have a few pictures of them making string on the left-hand side there. They actually they are using the mother-in-law's tongue and getting the fiber out of it and then taking that fiber and then the lady rolling it on her leg et cetera, to make a string or rope. 
Then we have the tubes that they live on, especially in the Kalahari, where there is no water, and they survive by getting the water out of these plants, and then the trap making and the hunting, etc. But now we've also got the, the psychological reasons for their survival, how they were able to exercise patience and resilience, their emotional security, and the simplicity of their lives. And then I get to what I would consider um, the beginning of the reasons as to, or explanations as to how their culture was structured. And a question that is often asked by guests and asked to the Bushmen sometimes as well, what makes you so happy? Because they can't understand how people with nothing can be happy. And the Bushmen see it a little differently. They consider happiness to be something that was God given. and what needs to happen is that people need to avoid unhappiness. And for them, unhappiness was actually caused by things like envy and greed, power, superiority, inferiority, inequality, etc. So they figured if you could avoid those things, then we can stay happy. So now if we look at the cornerstones of their culture and how they structured it in order to deal with what they believed was necessary to secure and ensure happiness. The first thing is egalitarianism, where they believe that all people are different but equal. And in that group there that you see sitting, you'll find that everybody has a certain amount or skill or something to actually contribute to the community. It doesn't matter if they're a hunter or an arrow maker or just a forager. Every person was valued for what they could actually contribute. Nobody was more important than anybody else. And it was almost like a round table arrangement with no leadership in it. There were mentors and elders, etc., but nobody was more important than anybody else. They avoided individualism at all costs. For example, when the guys came across, and I didn't realize at the time, to actually look at the spoor that I'd identified, they did it as a group because not one single person is going to take the credit. They are basically all sharing in this and, and um, contributing to the answer that they gave me. The next thing is a culture of sharing and giving, which they practiced. And people, I want to emphasize here that their culture was not something that was just theory. It was something that was actually practiced. And a lot of what happens today is actually still proof um, of them exercising their culture. Their Naira system is a system which used by this clan, which they are called the Guique. And Guique people actually means bush people. And their Naira system was an exchanging of gifts, the actual giving and receiving of gifts, which happened between individuals, and it even happened between clans. And it actually cemented relationships between the members of a community and between neighboring clans. And giving, as we know today, or I think psychologically, we hear that the psychologist talking about the actual value of being able to give because it contributes towards providing satisfying emotional relationships with other humans, which is essential for human happiness. And I think today we've actually substituted for this by playing with uh, social media, et cetera, and looking for things like likes, et cetera, so we can get our dopamine rushes. But basically this is what it, uh, actually contributes to happiness amongst humans, is actually to have satisfying emotional relationships. Now here we have a picture of the Great Sour Hill. And this is in the central Kalahari where I am now working with a, a company called Roots and Journeys who have established a camp here so that we could actually try and promote the Bushman culture and also provide an opportunity for Bushmen to be taken out of the settlement camps where they are now forced to live and to get back to the land which was once all theirs. So there where you see these three gentlemen pointing out over the central Kalahari. They are pointing to the actual male hill. Well, they, they're standing on the female Tsar Hill and showing where their ancestors lived for tens of thousands of years. 
And they said that God gave us this land with all that we needed to live happily. That is a profound statement because that land provided their food. It was their pantry. It was their chemist with all the medicines they needed to live. With the group and within group and within the clan, there was the fellowship as we are social humans and they realized that we couldn't live independently. We needed our communities. And furthermore, there was the connection, their spiritual connection, which was their guidance. So with that, there was nothing else they needed. And they enjoyed a level of happiness that we battled to understand. So if people maybe could come and experience for themselves, they would see the level of happiness that they are actually still able to exhibit. And when they talk about necessities only, I think it's interesting that we need to think about what we need in our everyday lives. And we will find that most of what we need are needs that we have actually created ourselves. We don't really need those things. And they avoided anything that wasn't needed because any abundance that was created or uh, um, at your hover, um, hovering and gathering actually could create um, happiness because it would actually bring in the envy and the jealousy, et cetera. So they avoided any form of actually hoarding. And then they used to actually apply principles like the one third principle where they would only take what they needed to survive. There we have uh, Kara um, actually replanting one of the tubers, which they've now taken some from to drink. And they're putting it back in the ground so it can regrow. And they said, we've watched the Kemspok do this. They only take so much. And then the other animals come. The porcupines and others will come and eat from that. And we all share from that. Don't deplete any resource that we have. And the one third principle basically uh, was to avoid taking more, more than one third of any resource that they came across. Then the next thing was the community. And as I mentioned, as being social animals, community was all important to them. And they considered, they considered serving community as a life purpose because they realized that on their own, they could never survive. And the community was then much more important than any individual. The we was much more important than the I. The individual was of lesser importance. And we talk about our Ubuntu principle today, which is very much along the same lines. And that is I am because we are. They would not exist without the whole community. So connection to community also provided a sense of belonging. And today we know that we have this disease, which they call the disease of loneliness. It is because people have become isolated from other people. And this did not happen within the Bushman community. Love. This was huge in the Bushman culture. They understood this powerful energy or this powerful force. And they believe that all life forms are connected by this life force, which they called them long. They considered this life force to originate from the creator, God, or the great spirit as an expression of his love. And it connected all living animals and formed like a web. So some of these the spiritual leaders actually talk about this golden web that they see, which is an expression of this life force norm connecting all life on earth. And this is considered the most positive or healing spirits or energies. Then, of course, their connection to environment. They realized that for to, that to survive, they had to look after their environment. Unfortunately, this is something which we no longer um, under, seem to understand. And they considered themselves to be all part of one huge system, all parts interconnected and interdependent. And no, and no part was more superior than the other, and that included themselves. They did not consider themselves more important than any other life form and believed that all these life forms had to coexist. Otherwise, it would be the end. So this is how they treated nature, never abusing any part of nature, never taking any more than they needed to. Even if it went into drought periods, they would tie leather belts around their waists to try and avoid the hunger. 
because they realized that they all had to share what was available and any greed or anybody taking more than they needed to was severely frowned upon and even dealt with. And then we get to the spirituality, which is, is something which is difficult to actually explain. I am not able to really explain the spiritual behavior or life that they live. And I can only share what I have managed to try and grasp. And that is the ability to connect to what I think we can call the ineffable truth. And that means a truth beyond words. The Bushmen connected with this truth through their spiritual connectivity, through being able to reach high levels of awareness and of um, awareness and uh, um, consciousness, which they did during the trance. And there were different levels they would rise, and it didn't always need to require the trance dance for a spiritually connected Bushman to actually connect with the source of all truth. This truth they sometimes called the voice with no words. And also they would see through their visions, this truth and this guidance, which some said it comes through their ancestors, which helped them to survive and guided them throughout their thousands of years of existence and to actually survive hardship, etc. So this was a connectivity which I consider was vital in keeping the alignment with the natural world. Now, unfortunately, today, we seem to have lost this connection, and we are no longer aligned with the natural world, and which is allowing us to destroy it at the rate at which we are. Bushmen, which were considered spiritually strong, contained a spiritual energy, which is called Num. And this energy becomes activated when they dance, etc. And those who understand science could actually understand how it is possible to activate these energies which they con contained within the human body. The gentleman in picture there, Gada, very strong spiritually, he describes his connection as coming through not just his two eyes, but through eight eyes. And these are sensory points in his body through which he receives energies that actually transmit messages. And I have sat with him in a camp at night and he starts feeling around his neck and he tells me that there's a line that has moved into the area. And the next day when you go to where the direction he was pointing, you find the pug marks. So this is not an exaggeration. There is a connectivity there which unfortunately we have lost as modern humans. And some of them, and this is not just the Bushmen, some of other um, Aboriginal people also describe the human body as just being the shadow of its spirit. And spiritual healers actually go about healing the spirit in order to be able to heal their bodies. Now, for those who question this, I think we've got to look a lot deeper and say we've got animal behavior, which also we do not really understand how animals can connect to external um, information sources or external intelligence. They are able to predict weather patterns way before they arrive. And if any of you have read about the 100 monkey phenomena, etc., there are lots of examples. So I don't think we need to um, consider that all the instinct that an animal has is something internal or linked to the DNA or innate. There is an ability to actually connect to an external intelligence. And this is the ability that we need to, in my opinion, reconnect to in order to advise us and direct us out of the mess that we are in. And if we look at evidence from, the, from physics and metaphysics today and quantum physics, we know that all matter is comprised mostly of space. So most of our bodies are made of space and in that space are energies. So we are, in my opinion, spiritual beings and we cannot ignore that and just concentrate on the materialism and the physicality that the way we do today. And then the big one, how do you also avoid unhappiness? And that was by controlling the ego. They recognized this, this thing that was present in the human body, which had the ability to destroy their relationships. 
and that was the ego. And I think we need to just consider ego here as being an illusion or the image of self, which today actually controls our lives. So to actually manage ego, they actually prevented any form of individualism. And, and there was an absence of praise to worship that did not happen because that is what would actually boost ego. So when we look at things like fire making and making traps, etc., it was always done at a group so that there were no individuals that were getting more attention than others to avoid this boosting of ego. And they actively suppressed ego, like by insulting the meat was one of the processes where they'd made fun of a hunter. And if in say that the meat he's got is rotten and he was just lucky, etc., they continue this and, and applied it in all parts of their life to avoid ego actually destroying their relationships. Even the little games they play, like throwing the sticks. If there is one person who does do better of an evening or during a game, they may say to him, You can eat first tonight, but you will clean up afterwards. In other words, bring him back to reality to avoid the ego being boosted. And I think to summarize here, we can have a look at what the Bushmen consider human and inhuman. Kwemjuma is a word that they give to people who have too much ego. And they say that that is man, not is. All right? Inhuman, really. And associated with ego, of course, is greed, superiority, jealousy, aggression, etc., as I have written down. And there are more. Fear is one of them, which is something which controls our lives today, which they also manage to avoid. And then on the side of love, they have got those qualities which they actually built into their, their culture to ensure their long-term survival. Then we have the healing dance ritual. We all know about the Bushman dances. There are many dances they have, but this one in particular is, is to me very important because it wasn't just a, a dance to have fun. There was a purpose. And this was practiced historically on at least a weekly basis. And it was actually practiced in order to actually prevent ill health, and not just to actually heal people as I originally thought. So it was holistic. It was to actually ensure physical, psychological, and spiritual health, and to actually maintain the connection that they have with the environment and with the natural world. So they wanted to also perpetuate the connectivity to inner self, the connection to community. It was a bonding exercise and to universal intelligence. So it was a measure to actually sustain the way they lived and it ensured their survival. So now we need to ask ourselves why, so when or why or how did we actually have egalitarianism becoming hierarchies and inequality? When did sharing become ownership? How did humans suddenly become masters of the natural world? This one is a big problem because it doesn't just suggest that um, we are masters or even of those that actually consider us to be custodians. That suggests that we are separate from the natural world, which is not what the Bushmen believed at all. We are not separate at all. And what we are doing into now is ultimately going to destroy us as well. When did intellect, which is really secondhand information, replace universal intelligence? When did happiness become an event or destination? Right now, this is what people seem to think is that we are going to be happy at some stage in the future. When we get to the weekend or the holiday or when we buy a new car, that's where we're going to have happiness. But not the case with the Bushmen. And for most of those things that we now consider a destination or event is something we've got to pay for. How did we become R? And Cooperative companionship become competitive detachment. Suppression of ego become boosting and exploitation of ego, which happens all day and every day. And when did less become never enough, which is unfortunately associated with the ego that can never be satisfied. Is it a coincidence that all these changes support an unsustainable economic system? So I think this is where I get to, is that if conservation is going to be able to make greater inroads, 
I think we've got to look at what is actually the cause of our planet going in the direction that it is. And I think that what we've got is conservation is versus, uh, versus consumption. People like Sir David Attenborough, etc., have actually warmed the heart and the soul to our beautiful natural world. But the head is telling us another story. We have this conditioning that is taking place of the limbic, where our ego resides, and the parietal lobes, where is our hard drive, really? And I'm afraid that it has been fed information which is not conducive to survival and conservation. And for those of you that know the actual story, the Shiroki story of the, of the wolf, uh, the black and the white wolf, and um, which wolf is going to win this battle that takes place in the human, human body, I think we will call that the wolf instead of black and white. Let's just call it conservation and consumption. And which wolf are we going to feed? Are we going to get people involved in actually trying to correct the programming and conditioning that our minds have received? And in so doing, also change, which I consider one of the major problems, which is the perception of success. And this is a question I've asked in so many classrooms, I was a teacher once, as to what success means. And the perception is straightforward. It means status and material wealth, material gain, etc. And that is what is destroying our planet. Can we try and change that perception? And for our young people, we are busy trying to make a, a short film, which is called Are Your Eyes Nicely Open, which has got a, a deeper meaning. Is Can you see what is going on and what is happening to your world? And can we once again tune in to hear the voice with no words, to hear the truth? And hopefully apply some of the Bushman philosophies for conservation and for the survival of all species, including ourselves. And right now we are getting to a point where we're going to see some of the last Bushmen, maybe not physiologically, etc., but in terms of people are still, Bushmen are still have their culture. It's, there's not long to go now and that culture is going to suffer the genocide that the rest of the people have suffered. Are we going to be prepared to actually listen to the wisdom of our first people and hopefully begin to apply it so that we can enjoy the level of happiness that they enjoyed? I thank you all for listening and I hope that this message is going to resonate with some and that um, we can perhaps look after the Bushmen consider keeping them going for as long as possible, which is what the culture going as long as possible, which is what we're trying to do at the Great Sahil. And whatever help can be given, I'm very happy to hear from any one of you that are interested in actually contributing in any way. So thank you very much for listening. Thanks very much, Rian. Uh, I must say this is very much a uh, fruitful a presentation from Clive. Now, my question here is, and my head tip uh, to him, and uh, now, are these the uh, Bushmen that went to camp at the Union building? And secondly, what came out of that camping there? Because they were very much into them being recognized, their culture, you know, that type of thing. Thank you. Thanks for the question. Um, no, these are not the Bushmen um, that were involved in, the, in, in that at all. Those were, I would consider, more a Khoi than, than San people and South African, whereas these, that, uh, the Bushmen that I work with, are actually pure San people um, who have lived all their lives in the Kalahari of Botswana. So I'm not too sure what has actually transpired regarding the... Um, the Khoisan movement in South Africa, although I hear they have been allocated some funding and some ground at some place, but I don't know if that is confirmed yet. But I do not have an, an involvement with them, unfortunately. Oh. oh, okay. No, thank you very much, Clive. But at the same time, I think it's one group, the Khoisan, the Bushmen, and the, all those uh, uh, tribes. Uh, I should think they, they almost fall under one uh, category. 
like um, like if you can like if you can say life like uh, the Kozas, the Zulus, then the Leles, the Shangans, and the the um, the guys from Venda, you know, it's almost like though they're different, but it's almost like one big group, you know. There are some differences. Um, the, the Khoi people actually had leadership; they had ownership of property, um, whereas the San never had leadership. They were totally egalitarian and they never owned any property and they never owned any land other than actually using ancestral areas, which I did not believe belonged to them. In fact, they couldn't understand how any animal or any property um, could belong to any one person. So there are some fundamental differences between the Khoi and the San. And the other thing is that uh, I find interesting about the Bushmen, they were never engaged in war. There was never any Bushmen wars. And that, I think, is because greed and actually ownership, et cetera, was never part of their culture. Oh, OK. Thanks, Clive. Um, kind of a question for everybody. Um, what, what are your thoughts on the observer's paradox when it comes to Aboriginal or Native communities? Because I know something we struggle with in lots of parts of Canada is how do we help our Aboriginal peoples without bringing them into modern culture and technology with internet and wi-fi and access and it's like you want to observe their cultures in its truest form but the object of observing their cultures changes their culture susie could i reply to that just in yeah. my my limited actual experience i believe that the problem here lies and that uh, is, is what people aspire to so Although they do want some land and they want some rights right now, they have been affected by our modern world and they believe that they are not going to really be of any value until they actually have material possessions and status, etc. So that is what they are going to aspire to. And how you manage to sort that out possibly is to in some way change the definition of what success means. Because at this stage, it's all about actual material values and status. So until they get that, they're not going to experience the satisfaction and contentment that the Bushmen that I know um, have enjoyed. Good evening, everyone. And uh, thank you very, very much, Clive, for this uh, fantastic talk. Um, I would actually like to um, just quickly pick up on, on what Susie said, because one of my questions is uh, in, a, in a similar regard. I had. Um, requested the various times over the last few years um, to attend uh, the Kuru Sun Dance Festival that used to take place in a, uh, I think a little bit further north in Botswana, because I was also very interested to find out more and uh, attend um, these ceremonies, um, which I believe was actually set up for um, foreigners or for tourists to join to learn more about this without having to go into the desert and actually um, yeah, disturb them as I think uh, also Susie felt. I, I've been feeling the same way. So my, my, my question would be, is there, um, is there any way to attend ceremonies like this? Or what is the best way to, to spend time and, and find out more about them without, as Susie was saying, like disturbing them too much? I Eva, I think that that is almost impossible. And I think that um, because they are no longer allowed to live the way they used to live, they've been removed from all the lands that were basically, as they said, given to them by God originally. They are now living in places where they need to have money so that they can get money from the local store. So they are becoming commercialized, unfortunately. And uh, how you're going to avoid that now, I, I cannot tell you. It, it is a really a difficult, a difficult question. But uh, this is one of the things we do at the Great Sahel. And what we want to do is to actually provide interactive experiences with, with the Bushmen. And I, the day, daily ones are also, I mean, they, they, they're enjoyable. I like to have people there for three, four, five days at a time to really interact with the Bushmen clan and in their natural environment. But to take the money and commercialism out of it now, I'm afraid it, it, it is probably too late for that. 
Do they still have one main festival though um, um, around the, the full moon in August? I mean, that's what I was told in the, in the past. Is that, is that correct? There is, there is one that they have, and there's more than one, but that is one that has been going on for a while because some of the people I work with actually participate in that. It becomes it's like a dance competition. And once again, straight away, the word competition actually means that things have changed because there was no competition before. <laughs> but it is a, an, an a chance to be, enjoy the, the Bushman dancing and the energy that, that actually prevails. But I'm afraid uh, COVID has actually affect, affected a lot of that as well. So what is planned for this year, I do not know. Okay, well, thank you very much. I think it's very exciting that we have arrived at a time where Indigenous knowledge is... Um, is being acknowledged again. I follow this uh, subject a little bit all around the world and the message from the indigenous people all around the world is actually um, the same. And uh, as you were saying, they have always been conservationists. They've always lived uh, sustainable lives and um, yeah, and they make us understand that we are not separate from nature, we are nature. And uh, I absolutely love this. And thank you very much for your talk. Deja, thanks for listening. My question is similar to uh, Susie's question, but I'll start off with a, with a comment that uh, it's amazing how the values that um, at life described, observed in, in the sand com um, community uh, contribute to happiness, you know, protect us from, from stress, but at the same time contributing to conservation. So that was, you know, a, a sensitizing message about these key values that are important. My, my question is, um, you know, <clears throat> leaving the sand people to live their original lifestyle, our government has been, or there's a view that they are being denied access to, thing, to uh, amenities and um, you have a, a, a international organizations pressing the government to you know, um, help the same people to live the modern life. If they are left um, alone to live their modern life, it's more like they are denied. So what would you say about this dilemma? It's a, it is a tricky one, Richard. You know, we've just uh, made a short film that has not been released yet. It's called Are Your Eyes Nicely Open? And at the end of our filming, etc., we called in a number of the Bushmen and I actually asked them, well, what would their wish be if they would have only one wish? And they all wanted land where they could actually live without having all the, the actual pressure that has been put on them by society, rules and regulations, and the freedom to roam. Whether or not they're still going to aspire to become wealthy like the, the rest of the West, um, what they've been they're exposed to, well, that I do not know. But they would like to be given the opportunity and be given the choice anyway to, to live that life. Um, whether or not uh, it would happen is, is another question. So you are, you are dealing with a very um, a difficult area here, and I can't answer for all the different Bushmen uh, thinking. Thanks, Ruan. Can you yes. hear me? Yes, loud and clear. And um, Clive, I'm interested to find out if you have ever come across anything um, called a digging stone in Botswana. I've heard that they've been discovered in the Mapungubwe area and of course down in the Karoo and in South Africa they're fairly commonly found. And Rod Cassidy, who was one of the co-founders of this group, has even found them as far up um, as Central Africa. And I have read excerpts from the Bleak and Lloyd diaries in which they describe using a digging stone in a ritual of a spiritual nature, asking God for one want of a better word, to bring back the good hunting by beating the stone on the ground. And I'm quite interested, I know there's no, not many stones in Botswana, 
but I'm just quite interested to hear if you have ever come across any over there. Clarissa, I know the stone you are talking about, and it has attracted a lot of interest. Um, no, in that area, I have not come across the digging stone, um, but I have asked the questions, and it is not something in that central Kalahari that they seem to have actually worked with. So it has not been involved in any of the dances and rituals, etc., that I've been involved in. So no, I, I can't tell you any more than that. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Clive. Thanks for a great presentation. I think it's a subject that needs more airing. Um, and yeah, well done to you. Thank you, Clarissa. Thanks, Clive, for an awesome Thanks, talk. Clive, for I must say, I was, uh, it's a subject very close to my heart. So I really appreciate what you said. And I just wanted to mention one of the things that I, I can't remember if I heard it or learned it um, uh, in, in one of the books that I've read, but the, the whole concept that the Bushmen have is that they don't own the land, the land owns them. And if you actually think about that deeply enough, it's, it's quite a, um, I think that that whole, uh, it, it flips everything upside down, that they are owned by the land. And that's why they don't own land. And I, I mean, I, I think that whole philosophy is what we need to adopt um, in many respects in, in, in modern times. And I think the, 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 the I'm, I'm trying to, I'm struggling to articulate what, what, what I'm thinking, but um, the, the, the reason for their success as a community and a culture is exactly their reason for failure in the modern world because their openness and um, innocence, but don't take that in the wrong way, but the simplicity of their life is what has made them so vulnerable to other societies and other, other people. And only when we truly value them for what they are and who they are, how they are, it is when um, they, they're going to survive. I, I don't know if I'm saying it right, but I mean, just that, that whole concept that they saw themselves actually owned by the land where they dwelt. It was, yeah. But thank you very much for the talk. I love it. Thank you, Marty. Thank you, Marty. I think that it's not just the, the land owns them. I think that they just consider the land to be part of the bigger universal picture. And they are just a small part of that. So it's not just the land. It is the universe, the environment, and all that actually owns them. It is because they are so humble. Uh, I think that uh, it, that is what they are trying to say. And they are guided by this universal intelligence or the message from the, um, from the great spirit to the voice with no words. Um, and that is what the land really is. And they are inferior um, com you know, compared to, to the, the bigger picture. Thank you very much, Clive, for this wonderful, insightful talk and with a very clear message to all of us. Uh, this is really something to be valued. Um, then I would say, would want to say, contribute something from my own experience. I've been always very interested in the Bushmen, having started reading uh, about the, uh, uh, the, the lost world of the Kalahari as, a, as a, a teenager. And then I, 30 years ago, I decided to make a small expedition with a friend of mine to Namibia to um, the, uh, the Kalahari to meet the real Bushmen there before I had, um, I had met the Haikom uh, who had been displaced due to the civil war. And then I wanted to meet the, the Bushmen, you know, the son. And I was absolutely touched. We, we, we went there to find, out, uh, to find out about the ways they lived. Nobody knew in Vintuk what their condition was. So it was. It is south, south. Uh, it is um, south of Tsumkwe. It was in a uh, mm -hmm. in a kind of protected area there. And we met. Uh, somebody took us there, and we stayed with a small community uh, and accompanied them in their hunting and dances. And then we went to another bigger community. And we had the most amazing experiences there. 
because uh, I had taken some gifts um, to, there was a headman and his wife, and they had been settled there for some time, a very large community. And so we gave them these gifts and, um, and to the, the interpreter as well. And then in the afternoon, uh, there was a long row, uh, a delegation of women coming towards the place where my friend and I were staying. And they actually presented a complaint that we hadn't given, brought them any gifts. And, um, you know, we'd just given it to the headman and his wife and to the interpreter. So that was quite a predicament because, you know, how do I deal with that? And then I said, well, look, I'm only one person and it's taken me a long time to be able to save money to do this expedition and to study how they lived. And we, we palavered around, I think, for an hour and a half. You know, this had to be discussed. So we discussed it all out and then we, we parted good friends, you know, so this had to be dealt with this problem. And yeah. that was um, very interesting. And there were a number of, there were a number of uh, such um, contacts. And when we came away from, from, our, um, from our expedition, we were so deeply touched by their humanity. You know, we just drove around the corner and sort of, sat there crying because you know the people had been so open and taking us it, it's so, so wonderful we couldn't i can't actually describe what their humanity was but it was like clive described all the rituals and the healing dance and the way they partook it with us it was uh, just absolutely wonderful and yes i'm glad if our so-called civilization now turns to them and acknowledges their treasures and integrates that would be wonderful because we do need their spirituality so thank you thank you to share your love live yes hello yeah, that that is something that i can actually relate to and uh, i tell guests as well when they come don't single out or give anything to any individual or even uh, exclude anybody because that is what is going to result because you know everything is done as a group so you've got to make sure that there's transparency and if you're going to be giving anything it's got to be done in such a way as that everybody is going to benefit equally because otherwise you, you run that risk of creating some individualism and it then causes a lot of jealousy and envy and they, they do get a bit excited so I warn guests to actually avoid that type of thing. And we have a process to actually avoid it. Wonderful, wonderful talk. Very interesting. Um, I have two questions. I'm curious. I realize they have been around since longer than we've had countries. But mm -hmm. let's say in that area, what is the population number, um, roughly? And my Second question is, I'm, I'm curious about their greeting. Um, what I've seen in many parts of Africa is when people greet each other, it's the hand over the heart, um, which is not common in other parts of the world. And I'm just, I'm wondering how they greet each other and if maybe that is a, a you know, if it's something that originated with them or I don't know. Who originated that? Lorraine, to actually ask your, answer your first question, this population one is a very difficult one because you know, you've had now interbreeding and you've got these settlement areas where there's a mixture of uh, other Africans as well. So I think it's very difficult now to decide exactly what a Bushman is anymore. So I've heard, I've heard of figures from between 100 and 300,000 Bushmen between Botswana and, um, and Namibia, et cetera. But uh, as far as I'm concerned, when you talk about Bushmen who can really still be called Bushmen, I think it's probably down into the lower thousands and that uh, still understand and are able to practice their culture even to a less extent. So the, you know, the numbers of genuine Bushmen are actually way down. As regards a greeting, um, they do um, 
the heart greeting, I haven't seen with a clan that I work with, but then, you know, there are a number of different Bushman clans. And the groups that I work with don't actually do the, the, the heart greeting the way that you described it. But there is a lot of, um, of, of hugging and uh, holding arms, etc. And they are very tactile. This is the way the Bushmen actually live. With their children, with each other, there's contact all the time. So the greetings are warm and that have an arm around you, etc. And a hug when uh, you come to visit. But not, not their hand over the heart, etc. I don't know that. Thank Live, you. thank you so much for a wonderful talk. And I just wanted to share, uh, listening to you, I remembered uh, one of my most, I mean, favorite films, which I saw like 30 years ago, which I think most of us have seen, the series of uh, The Gods Must Be Crazy in South Africa. I mean, this was all about, if I understood it right, what you were talking about. Uh, the sons, I mean, it started to remember with this Coke bottle falling from the sky and uh, landing in the middle of a little Bushman uh, community out in the Kalahari probably, and starting to be used by everybody, but then sowing envy and jealousy. And they decided now this thing has to go, the Coke bottle that they never seen before. And the rest of the film was about one of their men taking the bottle to the end of the earth and meeting us, the Western culture all along the way with all sorts of most incredible uh, clash of culture, yeah. But the great thing was, he always prevailed, and the Bushmen always prevailed, you know. And uh, that made it so extremely funny for us. And uh, my impression was that that film uh, had quite. A, I mean, that was my impression at the time. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. Like, uh, pay, I mean, showing them very gentle and with a lot of sympathy, uh, basically. Uh, telling the world, and the movie became very famous, I think it went around the world, uh, making the world understand about the culture in a way which I felt was, was very funny, but also very true. Now, well, that's just to share this uh, memory when I listen to you. Yes, the, the filmmakers were actually very insightful into the culture of the Bushmen, and they basically used that as an example to show how just a little incident like a Coke bottle could actually upset the harmony with which they, you know, they lived amongst themselves because it in introduced this whole envy, jealousy aspect and unhappiness. And they did whatever is necessary to avoid unhappiness. And yes, they, that's how they got rid of the Coke bottle. So yes, it, it, it is a, it's, a, it's a lovely story. Uh, Clive, thank you very much. Um, just a question from my side. The, the clans you're working with, do you have, they have any um, rock art culture um, and or have they shared something with you regarding the rock art culture, the meaning of the paintings, etc, etc? Louis, you've actually found one of my weak points here as well. I do not um, fully understand it. And I think there's a lot more that we're still going, that's still going to come come out of, of studying their, their rock art. Uh, unfortunately, other than that South Hill area, which um, which is where you know, I'm working at the moment, that was about the only rock available. So there was very little rock art. Even on that, that hill, we haven't managed to find the rock art. So their, their, their artwork for me actually uh, holds a bit of mystery. And um, I've read up what other people have said about, about the arc and uh, made by artwork and how this was only the work of, um, of uh, uh, healers, et cetera, in a state of trance, et cetera. I, I actually do not understand and I'm able to, to explain it to you, but in that area, there is very little or, or no rock art in the central Kalahari. Uh, 